Okay, good morning everyone. Let's, uh, let's get started. Um, thank you very much for coming at what I know is short notice. Um, Jeff and I were just talking at the front here, um, and we were saying how nice it is to get to the point where all the talking, well, not all the talking about planning for flexible learning projects, but now we can actually get to see the whites of people's eyes who are going to be doing some of this stuff. So um, we're really excited. We're thrilled at the, uh, the range and scope of projects that have come forward and, and slightly terrified at the, uh, the, the prospect of trying to support each and uh, all of these projects as they go forward. I think I'm, I'm now at the point where I recognize most faces around the room, but maybe not everyone knows me. My name's Simon Bates. I'm the academic director of CTLT. Uh, I'm one of the people involved with the, the flexible learning initiative here at UBC. So this is the, the we called it an orientation session. It's really a kickoff session for the projects that have been identified uh, as going forward into the proposal development process that in many cases will result in your project being supported and funded and leading to the sorts of things that you've uh, identified you want to do in the, the letters of intent that everyone submitted. Um, what we're going to try and get through today is really three sections. That represents the, the, the range of things we're going to try and cover um, but not the order. Angie Redish, who's uh, leading the Flexible Learning Initiative, was going to talk at the start about support models and support structures and, and generally just enthuse you all if you needed any more enthusing about flexible learning. Uh, she's been delayed at a Board of Governors meeting, which uh, should finish in the next half hour or so. So what we're going to do is we'll put number one down to number two, and we'll start with number two, and that's really to give people a sense of the proposal development process. So how we take all your great ideas and enthusiasm from the LOIs and actually turning, turn them into full project proposals with a clearer idea of what you want to do, how big you're aiming, and when you want to, uh, to implement these transformations. So Jeff Miller and Andrea Hahn from CTLT will present that bit. And I maybe should have said right at the start, we are in an interactive teaching space. And I am not going to stand at the front all the time. So please, if you have questions, just shout out and interrupt as we go along. The session is being recorded, so you'll need to make sure your question is both sensible and heard, as it will be recorded for posterity. Um, but really, this is an information session. We want none of you to go away with questions unanswered um, about the actual initiative and how the proposal development process will, uh, will unfold over the next month. So we'll start with that piece from Jeff and Andrea, by which time, we hope, Angie will have arrived, and so we'll loop back to her bit um, afterwards. And then um, at the end, I wanted to do a short piece on ways to engage the various projects at a level bigger than simply support for your own project. So I'll not preempt that discussion, but we want to find out, get a bit of a sense from you, what kind of support structures you would find most helpful or most useful. Okay, so I'll hand over to, uh, we'll, we'll trade the microphone. And the clicker. We're just being economical with resources. We could only afford one microphone. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Miller. I'm a senior manager with CTLT, and I'll be involved in the flexible learning project for the foreseeable future. Um, it was, as Simon said, it was really fascinating to see all of the letters of intent come in, um, in part because of the number. Um, I think we had in total 63 um, applicants come in through the pool, and just the range of, of projects. And some of these projects are uh, 
course level where people are intending to look at a blended or a flipped classroom. Others are full programs. And I, I think part of what we need to do as we go through this next month is kind of move from the idea of our intention to uh, into a planning phase. So I wanted to talk a little bit in terms of how we would like to go through uh, the month ahead of us with some idea of um, what it will mean in terms of some of the support you can draw from uh, from us to assist in this process, but also some of the things that we're going to be asking you to think about and to write about uh, so that we, we've got a, a pretty good understanding of what the, the needs and the, the scope of the projects are by the time we're at the end of the month. So I've kind of divided up June into five different uh, stages. So today we're at the orientation, and some of you already have made uh, appointments for the interviews that we want to have uh, individually with the team, so that's the need analysis. We'll move into talking about goals and scope, project needs, the budget schedule, and at the end of the month, we'll magically, with as many of your projects as possible, have something we can point to and say, we've got a plan, we know what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, and what we need to be able to do it. So starting with today's uh, overview or kickoff, we really want to give you a sense of the, the, the kind of broader structure of the initiative, some of the things that you can expect in terms of support from different central groups around campus. Um, we are going to move into um, a series of parallel interviews with the individual groups. Um, you'll notice that there's a URL there, uh, http bit.ly dot uh, or bit.ly slash UBC underscore FL. If you have not yet signed up for an interview and you are able to in the next three days, please do so because that will just help us to kind of dive down a little bit more and uh, understand what your projects are. As many of you probably found, um, the letter of intent form really didn't have a lot of space for you to elaborate in, uh, in, in much detail what you were planning to do or it didn't get into a lot of detail so we didn't ask you anything uh, too um, complicated about the scheduling or the budgeting of your projects, for instance. So we want to start that up. So we, we are trying to get all those schedules arranged for those interviews. So if you haven't yet signed up, please do so today. And then we'll have uh, someone who will, will talk further with you. So what we want to have by the end of this week is a fairly high-level overview with more details about each of the projects. And then what we'll do as a team is, is start to kind of try to organize that into an understanding of the different kinds of projects, the different kinds of needs that uh, come forward from the community. As I mentioned earlier, I mean, we have, we have projects that are a single course with a few media needs. We have whole programs that have very complicated needs. And we want to have a way of rolling that up so that when on June 12th, the Committee of Deans kind of says, so what have you been up to? What, what kind of response do you have from the community? We have some fairly good details that we can offer um, to kind of give them some clarity about the kinds of projects that are underway. So we're going to do an initial roll up, very high level, to the Committee of Deans, June the 12th. And then from that and the analysis we're able to do by the end of the week, we're going to start to assign some project resources to support your teams. One other thing I, I really want to comment on is that each of you starts from a different place. So some of you as a project team have been working on this stuff and are long down the road in understanding and implementing what you want to do. Some of you are very much newer to the process and are, are just getting started in terms of how you're organizing this. And we want to engage with you where you are and understand what your needs are rather than assume that we know what you need, we know how best to support you. We're going to have some dialogue around that to best understand how we can put some resources uh, um, in place to support your projects. And, and please, as Simon said, interrupt me as, as you have questions and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll happily entertain them and either Simon, Andrea, or I will, will respond to you. So following the, the interviews that we'll have during this week, we want to then kind of spend some time, we'll, we'll have some people working individually and we essentially have about a two week period, two and a half weeks, where individual project teams can be working um, you can be working w within you know, the, the grouping that you already have and we'll provide some assistance to you and we'll go through whatever iterations we need to in order to try to work through what the project goals and scope are. So we hope to kind of use that as an opportunity to clarify details, work through the specific needs. Um, there has to be some you know, little tiny things figured out like, okay, so what kind of project team do you need? 
So most of you put some pretty good details in the letters of intent in terms of the project team that you, you have in mind. So we'll, we'll start there and see how the project is being resourced in terms of the, the resources, the people from the faculty, and then what additional uh, people from the central uh, groups are able to assist you. Um, we'll also be talking about you know, the, the kind of flexible learning model that's being used. And I think a question that a lot of us still have is, well, what, you know, what does this transformation look like? Um, in the, uh, the, the material around flexible learning, we've described a lot of different notions of a flipped classroom, a blended classroom, a fully online classroom. But that, you know, when I looked across the LOIs, how you took those uh, categories and translated them into your specific context varied quite widely. So we want to better understand what does a flipped classroom mean to you in your particular uh, program, in your particular discipline, because I think it could look very different in different parts of the university. At the same time, we want to, as Simon said, take advantage of the fact that we've got a pretty broad community of people here who can maybe work together a little bit and uh, learn from each other in terms of different approaches to blended or flexible uh, development in different parts of campus. So we don't want to lose the possibility of some advantage of having you work collegially and to network a little bit around some of these issues. Um, we, we also want to make real uh, the idea of an evaluation plan. Um, and that also speaks to sustainability. So it's one thing to imagine what's needed to get a course developed, but where are you going to be in two years, in three years, in four years? And are there decisions we're making in terms of changing, transforming the way we're teaching that have implications for sustainability in terms of how we, we look at the courses um, as they're being offered? Does it change the teaching complement? Does it change the kind of spaces we need to meet in? Things like that. And I think we want to try to surface some of those details. So continuing on in that, um, in that period of time, we're going to pull in some, um, some help from people in uh, UBC IT to help us with the media assessment. Some of the projects have made some really interesting requests to, think, uh, to develop out uh, multimedia content. Uh, in addition, we've had people who are talking about wanting to have a flipped classroom where they're taking uh, the lectures and repositioning them to be uh, making space for more activities in class. So there are lots of different permutations of potential media needs and we want to understand what that looks like. We'll also have a consultation with people from the library and that speaks to how we might leverage the collection and the resources available as well as some assessments around the copyright uh, needs. And, and some of the projects have identified uh, copyright issues, others haven't, so we'll try to make sure that we at least flesh that out a little bit further. Um, finally, along the way, we'll be very curious to know if there are professional development needs, either in terms of teaching practice or TA support that kind of occur to us as necessary to, to make sure that we're providing the right kind of support to faculty and to TAs as they move into perhaps a different way of teaching. And I, I think that this is something we really need to be thinking about, particularly in terms of how we ensure that you know, the, um, the activities that we then roll forward are sustainable in terms of classroom practice. Um, budget and schedule, yes? Um, sure, well, I mean, there, there are quite a few different dimensions. So we asked in the LOIs that you, you take some time to ensure that you were consulting with students. And part of that is thinking about, you know, who are we doing all of this for anyways? I mean, our students should matter to us in terms of our planning. And they have some very interesting things to provide in terms of input to what we are trying to develop through these kinds of projects. So I, I think and there, there is a presentation by the uh, representative from the AMS about the need to really think about what are we trying to support in terms of the learning process for students who might be asking for different kinds of things. And so we are going to ask each of the projects to be giving some rationale or some, 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 some connection to how they've consulted with the students. And we might then think about the roles that students are being asked to play that might be slightly different than traditional ones. If we're asking them to come into the classroom and just sit and take, some, take notes, I think that's very different than coming, having them come in and, and work in let's say, uh, 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 team-based teaching teams or uh, case teams or other kinds of, of uh, configurations. And we need to think about the support that we need to offer so they can be successful. So that, that's something we really want you to be kind of taken on board right at the start because, you know, shifts in assessment, shifts in pedagogy likely require us to be paying attention to how our students also need some support and maybe changing some of their strategies in the classroom. So we will be working 
in consultation with faculty and st strategic decision support to develop the budgets and uh, to understand what the costs for the development phase of the projects will be. And part of that question, of course, is the ongoing sustainability. So we want to surface if there are, are things that are going to change in terms of how the uh, courses need to be supported when you're teaching them, um, when you've, you've implemented the projects. We'll also work during this phase to identify uh, project milestones. And you know, I guess I think about this in three separate phases. So there's a planning or development phase that we're just initiating now. There's an implementation phase when you actually say, okay, we're gonna go live with this new transformed version of the course. And then there are maybe a series of iterative evaluation processes that, that follow that. And already some of you have suggested that you want to begin September 2013. You're gonna redesign a whole program by then, <laughs> which makes us very nervous. Um, through to, well, maybe we start doing parts of this in September, parts of this in January, parts of this in May. But we, we all, I think, want to have a better sense of the milestones that we're targeting, uh, and then we can help to organize what the work can look like between now and those dates. So finally, after all of this wonderful activity that's gonna be taking place in parallel with great conversations all around, we'll have something that we hopefully can point at and say, okay, this is a plan, this is a way that we can kind of think of a structure for how we move forward. And each one of those will look a little bit different because your own context, your own uh, team configuration, your own ideas will inform what we do. But we do hope to have at least a bit of commonality in terms of some of the key points in those plans so that it's easy for us to roll it up to understand what the broader impact of the Flexible Learning Initiative is from a, a university standpoint. But this will also be a second check-in point where we're gonna check in with the faculty leadership and the Flexible Learning Implementation team. And that will also be the point at which we'll move into, which would be the project initiation where you know, for some groups who are targeting activities imp being implemented in September, you might be looking at a busy summer where through July and August, we're working full on to meet those goals. For other groups, maybe that happens a little bit later. But we have uh, the next few weeks to kind of figure that out and figure out what that means for all of you. So before I pass on uh, the microphone to Angie, um, does anyone have any questions? Any, any of the slides that I presented? What kind of budget are you talking about? What kind of <coughs> That is a perfect segue to Angie. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll let her address that issue. Okay, do you want to come up, Angie? Oh, one other question. Are these slides going to be available online? Yes, so the, the slides will be available online, where, um, but e even better than that, so will we. Uh, we've got a camera in the room, so we're recording this event because we had about uh, a dozen people who couldn't attend. And then you can also come back and, you know, you'll probably want to watch this two or three times and, and maybe annotate it and things. So we'll, we'll have this material and much more available to you as this rolls out. Um, just, yeah. This is a magic clicker. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's great to see you all here. I must say that when we put out the call for letters of intent, and with so little notice and so much ambition. And of course, we didn't really know what was gonna come back in, right? So I'm delighted that, uh, that you all are here. Uh, this is yours. In case you're wondering about the kinds of support that different groups on campus are able to offer you, here, here's kind of a, a service list. So, you know, we're, we're prepared to offer uh, support around the structural curriculum design, project management, planning support, uh, media design development in terms of, you know, that kind of video content, multimedia simulations, uh, learning resource discovery development, learning technology, uh, library consultation, professional development, and evaluation support. So what those kinds of things mean to the different projects will surface as we get a little bit more into this conversation. And maybe I can just speak a little bit uh, to that. As you can see, there's a CTLT, IT services, the library. There's a bunch of different pieces, different places on campus where support is going to be brought together. One of the things that we're going to be doing is uh, placing, placing centralized uh, liaison or coordination folk 
in the faculties, working very sort of embedded is the word that we use, uh, so that there'll be someone in your fa physically housed in your faculty uh, for a huge program. It might even be someone housed in the department. So we're really trying to. A key thing here is to support you. Uh, we, we can't do this. Only you can do this. So uh, one of my refrains is going to be. If you think you're not getting the support that you were promised or it's not working for you, you need to contact me, right? Because we, for this to succeed, you have to be supported. I'm not promising that I'll deliver what you want, but you contact me and I'll f try to f understand why it's not happening for you. Uh, just a question about the library conversation. Where will our branch library, our David Lamb from Sauter, where are they in the relationship? Are, are, are they a key component or are they a, a, a I don't know if that's for you or for one of the others. That's probably maybe Michelle, Jeff. Sure. I, I, that's a good question, Rob. And I think what we would want to do is, is work with them. So I think that if there are some resources that you, you see as being called upon from your, your local library support, that we should bring that person into the conversation as well. And, and we're starting to have conversations that, that with, at sort of different levels in the library, so with the library leadership who want to play an important role here, and then sort of with maybe more of the troops who will actually be playing that role to figure out how. And so this isn't a small change for the library, actually. They see it as a potential uh, larger kind of philosophical almost, like what's the role of the university in, in assisting learning? Uh, so, so that's a bigger conversation. Yes? One concern that's been raised in my project team is that the material that's developed be uh, openly available, not just at UBC, but across the whole community, but internationally even. Um, do you know if UBC is, is open, how, what the story is with restrictions on material developed? Michelle, do you want to take a kick at that? I mean, that's the, for me, that's, that is part and parcel of what we've been trying to do for some time. There's various ways we can do that, but certainly there is nothing that's going to prevent you from allowing that to be used more openly. And the university would be very supportive of that kind of open access, yes. Yeah. I just want to mention, uh, my name is Erin, and I've been teaching at Learning Library, and just focusing on flexible learning for the next year or couple more. Um, so to answer some questions in terms of how the library is support, I'm, my purpose and my position is to ensure that there is support directly related into the classrooms. For open access, absolutely a huge uh, key piece of this is open access and the possibilities of creating workflows to ensure that the content that is created goes through Creative Commons licensing and is allowed to be open access. But on top of that, I want to say, in addition to library contributions that relates to copyright and licensing, digital resources, etc., there is an information literacy and reflective learning focus that we are really interested in embedding into these classrooms, either through distance online tutorials or flipping, where distance online tutorials are created, and then there's a class components to do direct support for subject-specific materials. So. so just to follow up. Can I ask your name again? Erin. Erin. So our, our branch library could contact you directly? Yes, or you can contact me and I, the point of my, or the point of my work is to liaise with the people that are the most suited for your needs. Thank you. Okay, th thank you. Um, other questions? There's something coming out of that that I was going to comment on, but uh, I'll leave it. Okay, uh, <coughs> we're back to... Thank you. Okay, uh, this uh, picture, the, 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 tree, the tree of life picture, is meant to give you some idea of the scope of all of the different places that uh, we have decided that support that the review panel supported projects coming from. Okay, and the pr the pink program uh, projects are kind of multi-course or programmatic, and the blue ones are course level. Uh, initiatives. So you could just to sort of give you the broad picture that virtually every, I think every faculty is, uh, is, is on this picture. Uh, I hope that that, for me, that, that's exciting because it is Pan University. I hope that for you it's exciting because it means that there's lots of different people for you to uh, speak to who are going to be doing similar kinds of things. So I say this is meant to give you some kind of uh, a picture of the scale of uh, what came through uh, on our call for letters of intent. And <laughs> I thought I'd just, and, and some of you have heard me uh, speak before, so I'm going to sort of repeat myself, but, but not everybody. So I wanted to put this moment, if you like, into a bigger context of wh what the university is doing. 
right? And so the call for uh, letters of intent arose out of uh, a process where Dave Farrar, the provost, sort of talked to people in the community and said, the landscape of post-secondary education is changing. Some people see that as threatening. Some people see it as an opportunity. So uh, what, what should UBC do? And in February, after sort of this consultation process, Dave said, okay, I'm going to think about four different things, ways that we're going to respond. And the first and the one to move for, forward with most adroitly, I guess, was we got to take advantage of new technologies, of new understandings of learning to improve the undergraduate student uh, learning experience. Okay? So that was kind of job one. That's where we fit in today. Uh, also, though, and, and I have to say that from uh, the budget perspective, Nobody thinks that we're going to make any money out of this. In fact, this is going to cost us a significant amount of money. So is that the only thing that technology is going to give us is a, a way to spend money? Well, we've got to find some creative other things to do. We are also exploring uh, the possibility of developing professional programs, of developing certificate programs, uh, maybe an applied master's degree online in some areas. These will be, I mean, these won't be so pan-university, but there is certainly a lot of interest across a number of faculties in this kind of uh, approach. That, uh, that part of the flexible learning program, if you like, it is uh, moving ahead, and, and you'll be hearing more about it, but that's sort of another arm to the process. Uh, a third piece that is not yet moving ahead, but is sort of targeted for us to think about in the fall, is lifelong learning. What, what, what are we thinking about how continuing studies, how we can sort of approach some of the lifelong learning needs? So lifelong learners, people, I, I don't know, I'm, they probably don't define them this way in CTLT, but I think of these as people who don't want a certificate at the end, right? They want to learn something, they want to know about nutrition, they want to know about genetics, they don't need a certificate, they're just interested and want to learn more. So that's kind of the, the lifelong learning piece of uh, the landscape. And then the fourth plank of what we're doing is that we've, we want to keep a foot in the innovation landscape. And so sort of, we want to make sure that we maybe pilot MOOCs, that was the piece of the uh, program that's sort of happening first. So. We don't necessarily think that the whole university should be developing MOOCs, and we're not sure that how many we should have. But we wanted to know what happens if you have a MOOC. How does that work, right? I mean, one of the things that struck me as I looked at one of them is, how do you know how many TAs you should have for a MOOC, right? How do, how do you? So there's a lot of very practical questions, and we want to just stay aware of what's out there. So that sort of experimentation, make sure that we're kind of aware of what's happening, that's kind of the fourth plank, I would say. So, again, uh, you're, you're part of the first plank, the prioritized plank, and uh, I guess I kind of, I, I think this is kind of a moment. This is, uh, Dave Farrar, when he talks about uh, flexible learning, he says he went to a meeting, uh, it was around, uh, organized by Coursera, who, who run uh, MOOCs, and he said that there were provosts from, and he listed, I don't know, 10 of the top 20 universities or something, big private universities. And the provosts from these universities were all talking about teaching and learning, right? And he said, it's unimaginable that 10 years ago, these provosts would have gathered in a room and their focus would have been undergraduate education. So there's a kind of uh, change in the air here, which is, I think, hugely beneficial for students and for uh, faculty. And so I'm excited that you're all part of that and kind of leading the edge, I think, of part of that. Uh, let me, what do I want to add? Uh, I guess I'll repeat a couple of the asks that uh, Jeff mentioned. Just uh, as you're developing your project over the next uh, few days and then the rest of the month and then the rest, uh, there's a couple of uh, things that I would like to ask, and Jeff has, I think, mentioned them. And the first one has to do with, a, from, from my perspective, has to do with accountability. So when I talk to the Senate committees, when I talk to the board, they say, this is all great, this is just fabulous. How will we know you've done good, right? How will we know? And so uh, that's going to be, and there's different levels of the answer to that, right? There's answers at the course level. So how do you know a particular course that when it was redesigned that learning outcomes improved? So at the course level, there's sort of uh, different definitions of success. And, and, and there's, not even, there's not one definition of success here, right? It might be, uh, that, that, that the learning outcomes have improved in some measurable way. It might be that 
instead of targeting the average student, it was more possible to help a whole array of students with all different backgrounds when they come into the course. So there's not a single outcome, but at the course level, we need to demonstrate success. We need to know what success is, and we need to be able to, to demonstrate it. And then at the project level, I need to be able to go to the board and say, this is how much of, your, of the university's money we spent, and this is why we think that we've accomplished a good thing. Okay, so uh, here I'm, I think most of you probably want, for your own sake, you want to know has what you've done made an impact? If it ha has, but it's not perfect, well then you tweak it and you kind of move on. And I think that's what Jeff was implying, that evaluation isn't a one-stop thing. You evaluate, maybe you tweak, you evaluate, and I certainly think that's some of the learning that came out of Carl Wyman was that it's not one day and you're done, right? You just tweak as you go forward. So the first ask is around evaluation. As I say, I, I think that it's, I strongly hold that we need to be accountable. And so we need to think about uh, measures of success. And then the second ask uh, comes back, and again, Jeff mentioned this, is working with students. And here's, I think, we're, we're going to, I think Simon's going to talk about how to, the possibilities to kind of coordinate amongst yourselves. But I think that, that this is an area where some of you may really say, well, I, and in fact, in the LOIs, some people said, we'd love to work with students. What's a good way to do that, right? And off the top, I mean, so thinking of my experience, I would say two good things to do would be to talk to your, say, Economic Students Association, for example, right? Because they, they represent students in your department. But also talking to course alumni, like the people who took it last year, what did they think that they would like to have seen? What were their hurdles and so on? So I think uh, by talking to each other and by talking to students and listening with students, we'll get lots of ideas about how to engage with students uh, on these process. Okay. Uh, what else? What, what will happen if I flip the slide? It'll tell me what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, LOI timing phasing evaluation. Okay, so I've skipped around a little bit. On the budget for flexible learning, again, there's kind of a macro and a micro uh, aspect to this, right? At the macro level, the university is committed to spend roughly a million dollars for each of, say, three years. And I don't, and I think that it's not meant that that will stop, but that's kind of the planning horizon that we have. So there's a significant amount of money. Uh, I think that the provost view is that, to some extent, this should be demand driven. Uh, within, uh, I'll say within reason. We've had detailed discussions with the biology department about, and, and in general with the faculty of science about what's the experience of Carl Wyman on how much it takes to redesign a course. And I can say that the numbers are all over the map. Right? And, and as you talk amongst yourselves, you'll realize that the dimensions of what different people have, the, the ambitions, I guess, very dramatically in uh, scope and in scale. So I don't have a single answer for what the um, budget for a particular course or program redesign is. Uh, that's as you work with the team to, over the next two or three days, we'll get a feel for what you think is kind of needed for the scale to, to realize your ambition for your courses, okay? As we do that, I mean, if your ambition is, I don't know, there will be ambitions that are too ambitious, I guess. Or it's, I could imagine ambitions that are too ambitious. But I, I don't want you to kind of minimize. Some people have uh, gone a long way already in, in doing things, and they just want to sort of top up. So that's kind of a, a relatively inexpensive approach. Other people want to totally transform a course, and they want to build a fleet of, you know, 10 videos a week and have online assessment. And so, excuse me, they're going to draw on all those resources that Jeff listed. Right? So when I'm budgeting, I'm thinking of the cost of all those resources. I'm not only thinking of the cost uh, to your program. But we will be able to support faculty members in, for instance, buyouts, in teaching assistants, in postdoc fellows who can help develop course material. So there, there is scope for that, but the actual budget for your proposal is what you're going to work on over the next three days. Then we're going to kind of wrap them together, go to the dean and say, here's how we're thinking of sharing the cost with you, dean. And they're going to, and, and we've had conversations with the deans, so we haven't had a nitty gritty conversation because we don't know what the ask is. But we have had conversations with the deans and they're supportive of this. And the primary, more than half the funding will come from uh, the flexible learning initiative. So I think that's what I want to say about budgets at the moment. Um, I think I've taught timing phasing. One of the ways, so I guess if all of you uh, stepped up in these interviews and said, 
We're going to go on September the 1st with a full redesign, the whole thing. Then I think the budget would be challenged and our resources would be challenged. Luckily, I don't think that everybody's ready to do something on September 1st. And so I think that what we would like to do is learn some of you want to do th things September, some January, some will just be getting the ground laid over the next eight months and will actually first really implement something even next summer, even next September. And that phasing out is going to help us on the budget front and help us on the resource front. So you, we're, we're very open to that kind of phasing. We're not going to say, oh, well, if you don't go in September, then you have to apply to some other competition. No. We're, we're happy to work with you. Uh, and as I say, some projects will they'll have a long lead time, right? It's like building a building. You kind of don't put the shovel in the ground the same day you decide to go ahead and build the building. So that's uh, on timing. Okay, I think I'll uh, stop here and uh, take questions. Yeah. Probably not a surprise to come from the business school, but it's the opposite question that to the comment that the person asked over there. Uh, do we have a policy or position for those faculty who do not want to sign away the intellectual property of their content? We do not today have that policy. We're working on it. We're working with Hubert Lai. So uh, that's all I'm going to say. But yeah. Yep. There's a dominant situation with the dominant funding. There's the standard rate of the faculty. They will have to go. They have to have skin in the game, right? So this isn't kind of a faculty can sort of just ask us for money and we're going to uh, give money. So the faculties need to have skin in the game, but it's that level of engagement. But all of your projects, the faculties want to fund, right? Because the faculties, the deans were asked to uh, rank projects, and if they said, no, we wouldn't put any money into this, you're not here, right? That's, uh... okay, any other questions? Okay, Simon, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so we had um, no real idea for uh, how long this was going to take. It looks fairly likely that we're going to, uh, we're going to be finished early. Um, that being the case, um, any individual questions that people have, we're happy to hang around and answer them afterwards, one-on-one -on -one or one on a small group. Um, but just before we finished, I wanted to, to share some in initial thoughts about how we support you as a cohort of people who are all going to be designing, developing, delivering, and evaluating course or program transformation projects. And one of the things we did when all the proposals came in was, you know, aside from the usual slicing of we've got so many from AppSci and so many from Arts and so many from Science, um, we started trying to group them according to what they were intending to do. And a number of them fairly you know, unsurprisingly wanted to do something that you could put under a broad umbrella term of flipped classroom modality or some kind of flipped teaching. Um, at which point, I had an idea. And my idea was that as we go through this, one of the things we need to do is, in addition to the individual project support that we're going to build out over the next few weeks, that you've heard about, we need to find some way of connecting people who are doing similar sorts of things. Even if one of them happens to be in science and one of them happens to be in history and one of them happens to be in commerce. Because my observation is that it's not that we don't do enough of this, but the opportunities for people to get together and have these conversations are, are more limited than we would ideally like them to be. So this is a fantastic opportunity to have those conversations. And so just following this through about the, the, the flipped classroom idea, um, I came up with the, the, the idea of trying to get people together as a collaborative network. We called it the flipped lab that was designed to augment the support for each individual project. So you want video production support for your project and you want instructional design support and you want evaluation support, fine. But there's value in getting people together who are doing the same sort of things. Uh, and it's not limited to people who have 
just funded projects in this round because we want to have a broader conversation with people who've kind of heard about this but don't really know enough about it, want to find out more um, in terms of the pedagogy, the practicality, and the evaluation of effectiveness of um, flipped classroom approaches. So one of the things I started doing a couple of weeks ago is approaching people who have actually done this kind of thing with courses that are running right now at UBC for UBC students. Uh, and in the course of short conversations with them, I came up with about, well, I put two screens worth of <laughs> topics that I think it would be useful to, to surface and discuss. Uh, we actually came up with about two pages worth of things that it would be interesting just to have a discussion about for people who were engaging in these kind of flipped classroom transformations. So I'll just run through a few of them. Um, what media do you use? Screencasts, textbooks, videos? What's the quality of the video? How do you know it's effective? Is reading a textbook more effective than watching a video? How do you know? What's the evidence by which you can tap back into that evaluation piece of how do you know what you're implementing is going to be effective? Um, a really key one that I think we're in danger of missing if we just focus at the course level is student workload. Because it's really easy to design outside class experience that you think, this is so good for my course and students will love doing this. And they might love doing it and they might be engaged to do it. But students are typically taking five courses at the same time. So if you're incrementally, almost accidentally, increasing their workload in a number of courses, aggregate that up and it becomes a huge problem for them. Um, instructional design, dealing with student resistance. Many of you I know um, are aware that Eric Mazur is visiting on Friday. Um, he is someone who's probably one of the most well-known people to have promoted and championed this. He had significant resistance from students. You know, Harvard students coming up to him saying, I'm not paying my so many thousand dollars a year for you not to teach me. So there are issues around managing uh, student resistance to this kind of an instructional technique. Promoting this kind of thing to colleagues. If colleagues are curious about what you do, what sorts of things, you know, other than opening the doors of your classroom and inviting them in, how can you engage them and involve them? Um, team teaching approaches. Um, I was fortunate this year that, that I actually co-taught my section of a first year physics physics course with a new hire. Um, and I'm not ashamed to say that I learned a huge amount from her in doing that. And ideas about when you open up the classroom in this way and you have students as more actively engaged participants in the classroom, doesn't just stop at students. Many courses have lecture TAs that play an active part in the, uh, in the classroom and the classroom dynamic. And then pedagogies beyond standard flipped classrooms, where do you go next? What about, what does spaces for flipped classrooms look like? You know, we've got a number of lecture theatres like this, but if you're interested in creating media and resources, yes, you could come down and film it here or in other rooms that have lecture capture facilities. Um, but what about DIY rooms, somewhere where you could go, and I know some buildings around campus particularly the newer buildings, have these facilities built into them where you could go and just record your 10 or 15 minute talking head with your PowerPoint slides and there's a process and a workflow to make it available for students um, in, a, in a more flexible way. So just a, a, a small, fairly short list of things we came up with um, through conversations that led us to think that this, given the number of proposals, I, um, from the 63 that came in, I bucketed about 20 of them that mentioned flipped or blended or inverted classrooms of some type. Um, we want this to be faculty-led and supported by um, CTLT and other units. We want it to be a broad conversation. I've approached a number of people who I think um, we haven't exactly figured out what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, but expressions of interest from a nucleus of people um, who've actually had experience. None of them would claim to say 
I have the blueprint for how to do this, and all you have to do is copy what I do. But we've all had experiences of doing this. We've all had issues and challenges and things that we've encountered as we do this that make us think, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if other people um, have grappled with these same sorts of issues. Um, so really, what I wanted to do in this section is, is two things. To alert those of you to have flipped classroom modality as part of your project design to say, we'll be getting this flipped lab community up and running and you know, we'll figure out what it is we're going to do and how we're going to engage with people. But to use it as an exemplar of the types of support clusters that we might envisage forming and really turn it over to you for, for your comments about are there other clusters that you think we should form? If we were to organize events, what kind of events would you find valuable? What format should they have? What would actually get you out of your department and get you talking to people? You know, like with students, do we need pizza? Or, no, we're probably not allowed beer, are we? No. Angie's making beer signals, that's a good sign. Um, and at, at what scale and frequent, frequency? So should these be at your department level, faculty level, institutional level? And maybe we don't know the answers to these, uh, to these questions, but just things to, uh, to keep in mind. One other idea I did have, reading through all the LOIs, um, you remember back to, we asked you in the LOI to say something about evaluation and success. And many people were very candid in their letters of intent when they said, you know, I don't really have much of a, no evaluation is important, and I deeply want to know if what I've done is effective. But beyond sort of student course feedback and maybe looking at exam scores, I'm not really sure what I can do here. So I'd welcome a broader conversation about what evaluation may look like. So that may be another topic that we want to think about bringing people together even just to share ideas of how people are going about evaluating the changes and the transformations. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. I'd be interested to hear comments or questions on, uh, on these issues or others. Yeah. Uh, course evaluations and even <clears throat> faculty evaluations go down initially. So you actually have to stick it out for a few years in order to see the benefit. Um, so if we're looking at evaluation, you know, how long can we evaluate before we say we fail? And and also as well, broader dimensions of evaluation because student evaluations of a course, and I think you're quite right, and maybe people have had experience of things that you know, they, it wasn't that they were a disaster. They thought they worked and they went well, but there was student resistance to it, and maybe it took a year or two before it was refined and it just became part of the way you do things. I think there are other dimensions of what success looks like as well, because obviously we care about the success of our students, and, and in their view, is the project successful in meeting its aims. There's also an individual faculty members or the team of people associated with teaching the course, what does success look like for them? And in terms of larger developments, programmatic developments, what does success look like for the department? And some of these take a, a long time to actually percolate through because you need to do the course. And again, that's, that's some of the things that are being found with the evaluation of course transformations as part of the Wyman Initiative. Uh, I, uh, I embrace the, uh, the, the, the use of the technology to transform the way that education is being delivered. Mm -hmm. Is there a concern in the way how, as a group that we're evaluating the first time, might think about the philosophical shift that we're about to embark on? And how can we support that idea to emerge as a solid, you know, shift? Because it's a, it's a, you can take a risk, so we can see risk and benefits, right? So what are the risks? 
So, so the comment was about the philosophical shifts in, in transforming and using technology. I mean, I think in a lot... We might use technology, but we might not be really about it. We talk about kind of paradigm shifts in some ways, right? So, mm -hmm. But maybe not all the elements need to be left behind. I, I, how do we bring that balance? Yeah. Yeah. So how do you keep that balance of not throwing away more traditional elements that you know are effective? And I think, you know, there's a tremendous... We, we don't start from zero here. There's a tremendous amount of this already going on. If there wasn't, we wouldn't have got 63 LOIs produced in two weeks, right? Because it's a very short amount of time to say to people, please go away and have great ideas about what you want to do, unless you've kind of been brewing some of these ideas already. Mark? I'd like to see some good conversations around how we take what we develop and do and uh, create protocols, processes, materials that bring in new faculty, novice, novices to the teaching of this. And I guess you know, the flip side of that is also what do we develop so that we help students understand when they come into a course what this is going to be for them so that we're really mindful with that sort of data level of communication around yeah. the learning process. Yeah. So communicating what we're doing to students and also involving colleagues, maybe new to UBC or new to the discipline, about what we're doing and why we're doing it. I just wanted to pick up a bit on the philosophical word, right? Because to some extent, that's to me the most interesting piece of this is how, uh, at the macro scale, so on the micro scale is sort of to what extent do you blend a, a sort of traditional and new teaching methods. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of interesting things at the micro level, but at the macro level, kind of the, where is the university at? That to me is a really intriguing uh, question. And I don't know if you've seen on the Flexible Learning website, every week we have kind of a, an update, a, a sort of annotated bibliography of all the stuff in the media about how the university is changing. And um, so uh, thanks to Will Engel for, for actually doing the annotation to that bibliography. So if you ever kind of have nothing to do on Friday afternoon, that's where that is, and it's, it's very kind of interesting. But we, I think it, uh, I'm going to try to get uh, a conversation going somehow at the university level about these macro uh, consequences, right? So whether it's going to be a series of seminars, the Daphne Cola was here last week, Eric Mazur, maybe in September we'll have like three or four uh, uh, meetings. I mean, I get emails from faculty to say, oh, you're destroying the university, or, right, so, so how do we think, this is, what, I guess it's the five-year out picture of what the university is going to look like that I'm interested in, and are we doing the right thing to, to position the university well in that five to ten year uh, perspective? So I'm kind of interested in, and there's lots of kind of noise out there, but I, I just sort of think the university is full of great minds. And so if we bring people together they, to, to talk about that level, that, that to me would be a fascinating conversation. And that, that's what I'm sort of trying to do, to that. It's an interesting yeah. moment in a way, so exactly. how do we capture it? How yeah. do we make the best? It's a cheap shot, but I'm going to take it anyway. But thanks to you, I never have a Friday afternoon where I've got nothing to do. <laughs> Yeah. Because we didn't know how to assess success except to say, well, we could look at the final exams in my course. Of course I know how to make students look really good, give them an easier final exam next year, right? Yeah. So the, the balance to that, how do you decide the students really learn more? And something that the university could really help a lot with is a more organic and uh, umbrella assessment of them. What really matters is how the students who finish my course do in the next course. Right? So we need the big data problem solved. We need a network of courses for this one's a prereq for all of those, and 
how is the improvement propagated? And I can't do that, and only a select few have access to the data, and then only an even more select few have the brains to interpret it. The stats department is here, fortunately. But I think that's something that somebody in your office could really help a lot with. Mm -hmm. And that really goes back to that point about evaluation beyond the micro level of what happens in an individual course. Because on the one hand, you care to what extent the students have a greater mastery or understanding of the learning outcomes at the point in time when your course finishes. But if it's a prerequisite, you also care that they still have some of that one year, two years down the line. And, you know, in some disciplines, and there, there is a lot of work that's been done to actually look at how to quantify those gains in understanding and learning. But I think you're absolutely right. The longitudinal piece to look at over a period of years requires that kind of broader view that might be at department level. It's certainly something that, as a, as a research topic and a research project, would be absolutely fascinating to do. Of course, uh, to introduce, let us all to that kind of evaluation because there are, uh, I think, uh, roughly 15, 20 sections of the prerequisite uh, courses, 100 level, and which are prereqs for second year and third years. Yes. And even third, at the third year, there are like at least 10 sections having those as the prereqs. Yeah. So these can be randomly introduced and. Uh, and, and also, if you are looking at something coming into, say, first year, and you want to evaluate the downstream impact of it in third year, it gives you a couple of time, a couple of years to gather baseline data before that leading edge of students actually gets to gets to that third year course. Yeah. In terms of the um, learning outcomes, is it possible to tap into an alumni network as well? Because what we're, if we're doing this philosophical change in how we teach at the university, it also changes the way our graduates will you know, go into the real world, I guess. Yeah. And um, does it have an impact on uh, the types of professions they choose, the types of things they end up doing, and, and their success in that? Is there any way to tap into that? I'm coming from medicine, we can tap into the grad questionnaire and we mm -hmm. have contact with the residents of programs and such, but is that a possibility for the university? I certainly think it could be. So the comment was about tapping into alumni networks and making sure that, that graduates of programs are equipped with skills and knowledge that both they feel equips them for their future career, but also employers think are, are the right kind of skills that they need when they, when they hire them. And I think that conversation best belongs within the discipline itself, because many departments and faculties will have their own alumni network, would be great to involve alumni of UBC programs who are now hiring UBC students as critical friends for what you're trying to do in course or program transformations to say, we think we're equipping students with these skills. Are, they the, are these the sorts of skills that you, you find valuable? Because there's, there's, there's survey data out there, and it's based in the US, that suggest uh, uh, I forget the proportion exactly, but it's something like about a third of students don't feel they're particularly well equipped with the skills they require for their jobs. And employers equally cite lack of skilled graduates as one of the lack of suitably skilled graduates for the main reason that vacancies at the entry level within their organizations remain unfilled. The question is, would the way we change this university, the way we teach at this university, is that going to have an impact on the value of a UBC degree that people will know this, this is a graduate from UBC, they're going to be better equipped than a graduate from another university? Is that kind of the overarching thing we're working towards? I, I, I think in many cases, absolutely. We, you know, we certainly hope so. because, and, But it's a scale problem, isn't it? A lot of people, if they're thinking, um, about a particular individual course transformation, this is not something that's accomplished in one course for a student. It's a holistic process that you have to look in a programmatic sense. But yeah, wouldn't that be a fantastic legacy for this initiative to, to change the way we think about 
what a UBC degree gives students and also what employers think a UBC degree gives students. Erin, and then come back. That what's interesting with some of the literature that's coming out now that is coming from business sectors, speaking about their graduate their students who have graduated and are now working in the field, is that a lot of them are talking about some of those skills that they don't have as it relates to understanding how to do research or how to write. So the supportive services that we offer in campus that is really nicely embedded right now in traditional classrooms. So for me, an interest would be talking about how we transition that into flipped, blended learning, larger classes, so that we can ensure that those skills are actually transitional. So. Yeah. I'm wondering about the relationship between the MOOC experiments that are going on at UBC and the flexible learning initiative. So, um, can we draw on those experiments, technology, design, Things, but also even possibly content, because I'm seeing some, some content out there already that might be quite useful in my own course. So I'll make, make two comments in response to that. The question, if you didn't hear it, was how can we learn or import from the experience that we've been having in, in delivering the MOOCs as part of the pilot this year? Um, so the first thing I'd say is there are things that, that we're learning in terms of CTLT supporting these MOOCs and the instructors who are delivering them. Uh, and I'll give you, give you one example. The quality of video, you know, when the first MOOC started, it was someone being filmed over their shoulder scribbling on a, a, a whiteboard in their hallway. Um, the production quality has gone up dramatically. There are now some really fantastic high-end productions with animations. Um, and so people might ask the question, you know, do you need that level of production quality to, for it to be perceived as effective instruction by the students or valued? So one of the MOOCs that's running um, in Useful Genetics, the instructor is recording all the videos herself. She's got a setup in her office, decent microphone, decent lighting. That's one of the main things that, that students have complained about is poor quality audio in, in you know, non, non NARMOOCs, but in previous, uh, previous iterations. What's coming through from these essentially homemade in your office but with decent quality kit videos is that the students can see the passion, the enthusiasm, and the quality of the instruction that they're getting. So I think that's a fantastic thing to bring back you don't necessarily need to have the full studio production for all your content that you might want to deliver. There's maybe a place for that, and you know, different courses are making use of it um, in different ways. But to think that it all has to be that high-end, high-value stuff, the instructor's passion and, and you know, the quality that they can bring uh, to, to these courses comes through even on, I wouldn't say low budget, but compared to a, a, a full studio situation, um, it certainly is. So that's one example of the things that we're learning from actually delivering and supporting these. Um, the other, and it goes back to something that, that came up in discussions around you know, issues and challenges with a flipped classroom. One of the things I'd love to see done as a project is for someone to say, okay, there's a, I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna pick on maths, Calculus 101. And there is, there's a, fa I think it's Penn State have a fantastic set of videos on, on Coursera for Calculus 101. To see someone think about, well, that's the best kind of visually effective animated textbook that I could use for my course. So I will use that as my content. So I will say to students, here's all the resources. We follow the, the structure of, of, of these videos. But then to think about what's the value add that I can bring, working with students in whole class meetings, with tutorial support, with discussion sessions, to really bring that content to life. Because it's practicing and engaging with that material, as with many other disciplines, where you really begin to develop some of that fluency and some of the mastery. Yeah, watching good quality content or reading good quality content, however you get it, will take you a certain way along the path. 
But I think you still need that time to engage, to work with peers, to work with instructors and other course team members. So it would be great, and I know some of the, uh, some of the projects have said, we will use open educational resources that we know are out there, we'll not try and reinvent the wheel. It would be an interesting experiment to see someone say, I mean, you have to be confident that that MOOC will still be there in six months when your course starts, but to actually use that content. PC-based or originated MOOC content, do we own it? Can we go in and take some material from Coursera, the UBC course, and say, I want to just grab that video, and I want to put that on my connector? At this moment, I would say, email the instructor, explain what you want to do, and ask them. Okay. They own it. I've heard a number of different sort of uh, somewhat conflicting things about uh, what makes UBC, like what makes one of these courses of UBC experience or what makes UBC different or transformational versus open access, creative commons, that sort of thing. It seems to me that there's some material internally to UBC that would be very beneficial, particularly around um, educating students about how this process works and, and learning. So kind of learning and teaching, but it doesn't seem to me that everything should automatically be pushed out into the open because otherwise you sort of lose that, you know, I mean, as a student, I paid my fees here, I, you know, I'm getting something special that you need to UBC. So is there going to be, do you see a continuum of sort of some things that are, you know, can be shared and, and yes, you benefit from seeing the Penn State health and videos and we've got some health and videos to offer back, but other things you're going to say, no, this really is an internal thing and so it's, it's relevant to a particular program and maybe that's not. Is there going to be a real spread of that? Like, is that going to be open to that? I, I just have a comment, I guess, that kind of assumes that the content is just what we're doing online. I think the, the whole idea of the classroom is that the students are going to be on the ground, we're not having a classroom room, and we're not just talking to them in terms of content, but we're actually applying it and taking it to the next level. So the added value of being an UBC student comes back to you. What are you doing? I would say this would be a spoiler, though, if a prospective student sort of was hunting around online and saw all of the, you know, the great bits from my new course, and then sort of it was. I don't know, somewhat anticlimactic, because they, they got here and all I've seen, you know, when they start to talk to the class and then the whole thing just falls apart. So I, I see it being sort of strategic in how you release that kind of information, you know, some parts of it, but not all of it. Um, you know, some of it can be promotional, but there's a certain blend. And I think it, again, it highlights that people start this from different places, and there may be quite legitimate different motivations. You know, we heard about making all resources openly accessible within and beyond UBC. And there are some projects where explicitly their projects will not work unless they're open to the entire UBC community because they're developing things that are intended to be used across different departments and different faculties. And other cases where there might be a good reason why the intellectual property and the ownership wants to stay with the, uh, the individual and therefore it's not released into into a broader space. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, maybe I'll mention, so, uh, maybe from the alignment initiative, um, that there's issues uh, originally around these ideas of content, you know, sort of, you know, the content would be created, it would be great, and it would be useful, and it would be available. I think one of the lessons learned there was that it's actually the content isn't the most important thing, it's the expertise developed uh, with faculty with their deep involved instruction, uh, that's really what makes it valuable. So it's actually, the, it's use of the content is really the important piece to focus on. Yeah, that's just, that's just. Uh, maybe I'll just say one of the things, especially since the motion is we'll be working in teams on content development, is that it's sort of important for the team to agree on some of these issues. Um, I have other hats I wear in the institution um, where I run into uh, conflicts between faculty members over who owns what and so forth. So, uh, although not everything has been sorted out yet, one of the things for sure with your team is to start deciding, you know, clarity about where you're going to be, and, and that clarity may include, you know, writing up an agreement between you and so forth, just for your own uh, peace of mind, if you will, on some of these issues. And then the bigger, you know, one-sided questions, 
you know, you may need to create a Commons license, whatever you want to do with it, uh, uh, is a separate kind of question, but uh, just for that, that piece of, of the shared intellectual property, if you will, that will arise out of this, and there will be lots of confusion around that because many people will be involved in, in producing things. Just to reinforce that and, and to say that, yes, I think there are still open-ended questions at the institutional level, but agreement amongst your team and discussion amongst your team, great. One of the things for the cohort might be some discussion. Creative Commons licenses are not, it's not a one-dimensional object. There's all different kinds of Creative Commons licensing. So the university would be enthusiastic about people using those licenses, but they could restrict uh, access, they could restrict the repeat use, and so that those licenses, learning more about those licenses would probably be good for people who are creating content. And um, so, but just to say that we would be enthusiastic. So, so uh, what I'm hearing from you is that there's no CTLT imposed policy about how the IP is managed, or is that still up in the air? CTLT is, 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 not going to, is not going to implement policy. If there is policy, it will be at the university level. Okay, wait, somebody. And at the moment, the policy would be to encourage open access. I think that that's, but that's a weak form of policy. Yeah, good. Okay, and so the, the follow-up would be, uh, it sounds like there's latitude for a more collective uh, information sharing about what the options and issues are with respect to these licenses, because yeah. it, it, we'll all need to reinvent that bill. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And CPLT, uh, Will Engel, um, who's uh, been involved with this for some time, he's got a library background, and then he's been working on um, related to um, all of our open materials, so he can provide some context for that, and so he can work more broadly on that. So just a, a comment, I think, for everyone. We're, we're spending a lot of time focusing on what I would call the first half of the circle, that is the preparation and dissemination of information and knowledge. We also need to spend some time on the evaluation piece, not the meta-level evaluation of the success of the course, but the evaluation itself. I, I would be very disappointed as a student if I spent four months engaging in the technology and then I was forced to come in and write a three-hour paper-based exam. <laughs> And the challenges of all those exams are not trivial. How we're wired as man with people need to need to engage in those. Um, I'd be happy to share our experiences. Commerce um Sauter has done quite a bit with that and brought in service. So anyone who might have a current or future interest in online exams or computer exams, talk to Rob. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that, you know, we've had a lot of good discussion. Um, Kieran, do you want to say anything from a student's perspective? I apologize for sort of putting you on the spot, but you've got the amount of time it takes me to walk up these rather large steps. Um, anything you want to add from a, from a student's perspective? Okay. I think it was already mentioned quite a bit that um, part of what what um, we want to see done is engagement of students. Um, so we are the LOI that was submitted through the VP Students Office by the AMS and the GSS is around how do we engage students and provide resources to individual faculty members who want to engage students on some of the best practices and ways to do that. So we're hoping to be we're hoping to act as supports for that as well. So if you do have questions about how best to engage students, how we can help with some of the data collection we're doing around what students are looking for and what students think the university should be providing. We're happy to share that as well. Um, I would say that when thinking about engaging students, I would say start tomorrow. The sooner you can get the students involved, the better. I think a lot of the departmental clubs have been keen, and we've been communicating with them that flexible learning is coming and it might impact courses in your department, so they're ready to hear it and they're ready to be involved and engaged. So please do talk to those student groups as soon as possible. Thank you. Any other? Yeah. Um, I know that this coming from one of the CPLT Institute sessions. Uh, I really like that because the question was about, actually reminded me of my teaching experience uh, many years ago here at UBC. Um, we wanted to have a good discussion. Think about the classroom. However, the classroom setting, um, the physical setting space was, you know, all the chairs were vaulted and, you know, we couldn't really turn around. This is a great place to, you know, but what 
are thinking about, we are talking about technology and other pieces, but when we employ this flipped classroom model into the real classroom, I think we have to think about the physical setting as well. Yep. Physical space is, uh, is, you know, if you're building an instructional design or building a classroom activity, and you get to the classroom that you've been timetabled in and it does not support that activity well, then all your kind of thinking and your hard work uh, kind of comes to nothing. So, yeah, it's an important, it's another one of these side shoots that, that's really important, you know, just like technology and, and technology for exams, physical spaces and what sort of spaces should we have, should we refit, should we incorporate into new build. We've talked a lot about evaluation and assessment, and I wonder if in the list of resources available, we could add the measurement and evaluation course at UBC to offer you something and in putting together evaluation for at program level, course level, and I know that, uh, for example, the chair of the, the chief editor for the Journal of Program Evaluation is at UBC, so we could look at that as a resource and tie in the post yeah. Great suggestion, thanks. Okay, if there are no other questions, let me just close by thanking you once again for coming at short notice. Look forward to seeing many of you over the next couple of days as we start the, uh, the needs analysis. And any questions, just come and ask us. We'll be at the front for a while.